fourth professorship, or the, the fourth topic she's been professor in is communications. I don't know any other individual who's had a professorship at a major university in four separate disciplines. And so uh, she has sort of, near this stage of her career, is bringing things together, I think, yeah, in that's, a way that's, that's, that's very much understood. Very optimistic. I'm old. I'm, I'm, I'm 73. What's the correct response? You're not old. Don't worry. I tried that about 10 years ago. I was talking to another woman, and I said, well, how old do you think I am? And she looked at me and said, 63. <laughs> exactly correct. Come to the window. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not going to take any more oxygen, but as you will see, uh, Professor McCloskey is both deeply learned and also humorous, friendly, and just projects a real humane uh, spirit. And so I think you're going to learn a lot from her, both in what she says and just from her example. So please welcome Thank Professor McCloskey. Thank you. Well, I think that I thought I would talk about this, this article of mine. Um, which has been kind of bouncing around for quite a while. It's, it's come out in various versions. Um, it started as a commentary. I, I'm not going to move too much. In fact, why don't I sit down as much as I can so you don't go mad with the camera. Um, it started out as a comment on a book and paper by Martha, Mar Martha Messbaum, who's a Professor of Law and Philosophy at, at the University of Chicago. Mar Martha is very nice. Uh, uh, um, she, um, she writes a book every year. She sighs for I hate her. Uh, <laughs> she runs five miles a day. She's driving me nuts. Um, she's very Scholarly. She's also a professor of classics. She at least had three, and it's at the University of Chicago, not at USC. Um, but the, what bothers me about her book and about lots of other books that you read in, in this class is an attempt to reduce political theory to prudence. To maximize it, to max you, as I call it, in, in German, max u. Maximize utility subject to constraints. And that's the, that's the modern theory of economics. I call it Samuelsonian economics, after my, my mother's long time mixed doubles tennis partner, Paul uh, Samuelson. And, and, and the idea is that it's a, it's a utilitarian idea that you reduce humans to um, the deals they make. Now, as an economist, I'm an, an economist, not a communist, an economist. <laughs> and I, I, I understand the argument. I understand why people want to do this. Hobbes is a, is a perfect example of this. Yeah, have you re read Thomas Hobbes in the class? Yeah. Um, or Ma Machiavelli. Did, did you read some Machiavelli, The Prince? But he's, he's earlier, of course, and he, it's the same deal. Um, how the prince can maximize his welfare. Here's what you do. Make people fear you rather than, than love you. That'll, be, that'll work. Um, and Hobbes is the same way. Make the Leviathan is necessary because uh, self-interest will drive people to the war of all against all, and the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So there's there's a and the, the, all the way down to um, James Buchanan. Do you read? Jim Buchanan in this course at all. Have you, have you read it? Yeah. yeah. So you know about Jim. A wonderful man. I, uh, I, I didn't get to know him until really the last 10 years of his life. Um, as you mentioned, I was trained at Harvard, and at Harvard, our view of public finance was kind of the other end, the opposite end. It was the Musgrave 
approach to public finance, which was <laughs> the theory that the, the government is filled with perfect philosophers. And that we as economists, our job is to develop the theory of perfect philosophers operating the tax system, the tax and expenditure system. And Jim said, oh, wait a minute. I've noticed that people in the government are Max U types who have prudence, their own prudence, their own, um, their own happiness in mind. Let's watch that. So, so all the way from Machiavelli, Hobbes, Jeremy Bentham, um, uh, with uh, a great gap, um, uh, Anthony uh, Downs, um, <coughs> and then very strangely, John Rawls. Do you read Rawls at all? John Rawls, you know who Rawls is? Well, Rawls was a philosopher at Harvard. I've, I've always liked him. I didn't know him personally, but I, I, I liked to hear about him because he stuttered, and I stutter. And I, I'm very pleased when I find people who stutter and say, oh boy. Did you know that Marilyn Monroe was a stutter? That's why she spoke in that funny way. She spoke like this. Because that made it easy. She didn't stutter when she talked like this. <laughs> That wasn't a natural voice. Uh, Churchill, I noticed you have a statue of Churchill and he Anyway, um, Rawls was, viewed himself as a man of the left, although he's, he's a funny man of the left because he's, he's in some ways he's a liberal in the, in the root sense, in the old sense that I'm a liberal. Um, but he too has a Max U view of the world. That people, his, his view is the view that dates from Hobbes, that you're, you're to think of the ideal good political society as one in which people choose the kind of society they're, they're having behind a veil of ignorance, it's called. That is, imagine yourself before you were born. You didn't know if you were going to be slave or free, man or woman, Indian or, or uh, that is South Asian or American. And what kind of society would you want? And that's meant to be a test of what the appropriate society would be. But the trouble with that way of looking at the world is that you're too, and it, you know, it's not a terribly, it's not a, terrible way of thinking about what the good society is. But the trouble is that it's, you're maximizing something. You're doing max you from behind a veil of ignorance. And Rawls was trying to get justice out of this. He's trying to get the virtue of justice out of what's essentially an exercise in prudence. Right? So you say to yourself, well, I, I don't want to have a slave society because I might be a slave. And I don't want to have a society in which um, um, women are badly treated because I might become a woman or might be born a woman, be born female. Um, or I might, I might, I might. So you're to, um, Rawls said, um, you choose the form of society you, you, he, he believed he had solved it. It's a, not correct, but he thought he had solved it. He, he, he was interested in economics, uh, but he didn't really grasp it too well. He was a, a philosopher, not an economist. And he said, well, you'll, you'll maximize the min. You'll maximize the minimum. That is, you'll try to arrange society so that even if you end up in a bad position, you're a slave in South, you're a female slave in South Asia, which is about as bad as you can get. Um, you will uh, be okay. And, and he said, he claimed that that had egalitarian implications. That then you'd want a society where the least well off, that's how he talked about it, was as well off 
as they could be. So a social safety net, big social safety net, because there but for the grace of God, to put it in a sort of proverbial form, go I. So this, this test, this kind of ethical reasoning, is max you. Now, actually, if you want to know my feelings about Rawls, that's wrong. That's a mistake. It's not obvious that you would do a max, uh, a, a um, maximize the minimum. Why don't you, I don't know, maximize the maximum? Or why don't you take the average? What's this talk of choosing safety first? Why is safety first the correct utility function for this presumably max you maximizing person who's the driving force of the political theory. <coughs> now what Martha did in a book of hers, um, what she said, well, you, uh, you, you, you have to include love. And you know, I, I agree, let's include love. And if you have love, and then this Max you behind the veil, because she was a big friend and a, a student, actually, I think of uh, John Rawls, but anyway, a friend. You'll, you'll maximize behind this veil of ignorance. And if you have love, if you have but love, as St. Paul says, um, you will not be as uh, sounding brass or tingling um, symbol. You will. A, a good society will come out of it. That's what political theory is about. It's about speculations about how to achieve a good society. <coughs> and this is, Mark Martha's trying to do it by introducing the virtue of love. But I say it's spinach and I say to hell with it, <laughs> to quote an old cartoon. I say there's a deep problem here which is that people are not just prudence machines. Prudence is a virtue. And here's how I think about it. Now I have to stand up. Prudence is a virtue. But it's only one among seven principal virtues in my way of looking at it. And I'm not, I'm not just making this up. This isn't just, I was walking along um, Dearborn Street one day and this suddenly hit me. This is a combination. It, this comes out of the history of Western philosophy. And you can find analogies in both China and in, in, in South Asia, rather exact analogies. We have prudence, let's call it P. <coughs> prudence is a virtue. It's a trained disposition to good. Here's what I mean. If, if you're not prudent, you cross the street without looking both ways. <laughs> Prudence is the virtue of savoir-faire. It's the virtue of, it is, uh, it's phronesis in Greek, translated into English as practical wisdom how to do stuff. If you want to be just, but you don't know how to be just, so if you want to be loving, but don't, don't know how to be loving, prudence is the virtue that's going to make that combination of justice and love, prudence or love, it's going to make it efficacious. It's the efficiency virtue, which is why economists are obsessed with it. It's the virtue of doing things as well as you can. It's not about the other ends, which are love and justice and temperance and courage and faith and hope. No, no, it's not them. It's about getting stuff done right. So that's the, the economist's virtue. And then there's temperance, <coughs> justice. Temperance is control over pleasurable desires. I used to smoke. I smoked for, for, for 20 years. I, I always say that 
quitting smoking was harder than changing gender. It was really, really hard. Don't start smoking. smoking anything. It's really hard to get rid of it. But, but temperance is the control of impulses. I'd like to have more ice cream. I'd always like to have more ice cream. But, but temperance controls you. I'd like to indulge myself in various ways. So temperance is balance in the individual personality. This is Plato. This is the, the Republic. Because justice is balance in the society as a whole. This is balance inside the single person. This is balance inside the society. And in Plato's Republic, that's the plot. That's the story. He says the, the palace is like a person. And like a person needs balance. And that's what justice is. Giving people their due is justice. Now, you know, it's a very complicated word with a lot of it's an essentially contested concept. It's, uh, there's a lot going on in the word justice, but that's, that's one way of thinking of it. Then there's courage. In fact, I'm going to, well, uh, it doesn't matter. OK, let's just do courage. Courage is control over fear. If you are, um, you know, there are lusts, desires, temperance controls those. There are fears, aversions. The lust is you want to go towards something. The fear is you want to go away and be like Oblomov and sleep, sleep all day, hide in your bed. And courage is the conquest of fear. Um, and, and is essential for a normal life, obviously. And then there's love, which has Two parts. In Greek, it's three parts, but let's let's go with two. Let's do well. We can do it this week. We, we can do we can do the Greek. There is lower love. I have a dog. His name is Will Shakespeare. He's a Norwich Terrier. He's a ten-year-old Norwich Terrier. He's the love of my life. He's wonderful. He's much better than most men. Always happy to see me. He's very nice. And. Will, um, I love Will, but, and so that's filiar, eros. Um, don't, don't get too excited by eros, it just means that I, that I love it. But there's, um, there's a higher form of love, which you hear a lot in Christian, you hear a lot about in, in, in Christian theology, agape. It's the third of the, of the Greek words for love. And agape is love of the transcendent. Love by the transcendent, God loves us. I mean, I'm not making a sermon here. You don't have to believe any of the theology here. Or we love God. But in any case, it's a love of transcendent. It's not a love of individuals like my dog or my former wife or my children who haven't spoken to me for 20 years. But it's the it's um, it's it's a love of say economics or a love of uh, of uh, the college or a love of the Cubs or a love of God a love of something that transcends humanness and then there's faith and hope. Faith is a backward-looking virtue. It's the virtue of identity. I'm a Chicagoan, I'm an economist, I'm a teacher, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a Bostonian, I'm an American. Where I come from, where I come from, if you don't come from anyone, then you're Paris Hilton, and you're just a shallow, 
rich jerk. And, you know, who am I going to be today? I guess. I don't really know much about Paris Hilton, but I always use her as an example. Maybe she's very nice and thoughtful. I don't think so. Uh, if, you're, if you're that way, you're li actually a more lively example. If you don't have a faith, then you're like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is distinctly faithless. That's one of his main characteristics. I don't mean he's not a Christian. I mean, he's not, but but set that aside. He's not faithful to his identity. He's willing to be a Democrat or Republican, whatever works. Hey, whatever you feel like today. He has no convictions of any sort. So he's not, we, we say, not grounded. And in fact, in his behavior, he's not grounded. You can get very psychological about it. And notice that Donald is very sensitive. He doesn't like people who say he has small hands. That's unhappy. Um, and he gets mad at you. He's really kind of a pathetic creature. And when he falls, it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be very sad. But he's not grounded. Whereas, whereas to take another Republican candidate, uh, um, Kasich, is grounded. Every time he opens his mouth, you can tell he's grounded. You know, I, I don't know if you think he's a good guy or not, or maybe he's not, or maybe he is, but he's grounded at least. Um, uh, he has faith. Um, um, the last Republican presidential candidate has faith. He's a Mormon, but that's not my point. He's, he knows who he is and comes from somewhere. Hope is the virtue of having a project. It's forward-looking, unlike faith, which is backward-looking. It's forward-looking. If you're really hopeless, actually lacking hope, the word for it is Acadia, I believe. I think I've got the Greek correct, Greek and Latin correct. Acadia. I think it's a Greek word written in Latin, but I'm not absolutely sure of this. But Acadia is hopelessness. And hopelessness is the second most, in theology, Christian theology is the second most serious sin against the Holy Spirit. Pride is the first. Um, being hopeless is not having a project. Not, and you can see it's forward-looking. It's not, not having anything in, to do. It's not just not having anything to do. It's not wanting to have it. It's saying, oh, it's hopeless. I can't. And then you go home and shoot yourself. Please don't. Some woman has to clean up if you shoot yourself. So please don't do that. Keep, kill yourself some other way. <coughs> Don't kill yourself. It would be terrible for you to say. So I, I withdraw the suggestion. But, but that's what hopelessness is. These seven virtues are a kind of jury rigged combination of the, what, the, what, what, what the classical world called um, cardinal virtues. Uh, Cardinus, Car Cardus, Cardus, Cardus in Latin means hinge, like on a door. And that is the hinge on which the society, the hinges on which the society um, survives. And to, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Greek or Roman polis, a Greek polis, these four were essential for the polis to work at all. You needed these. You could do without the others, but you couldn't do without justice, temperance, prudence, and courage. The expedition to Syracuse, are you familiar? It's magic. <laughs> the door opened mysteriously. Are you, do, 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 do you know about the the Athenian expedition to Syracuse, do you, did that come up in your education? The Athenians, in fighting the Spartans, had the disastrous idea to send a con an expedition of 
of course, to Syracuse on the east coast of, of Sicily, which was a Greek colony which allied itself with Sparta. And their expedition was completely defeated and all the men were enslaved. Their army, it was a complete disaster. And that was a failure of prudence. So if you're going to have run a policy, you've got to have those. But the, the, the other three are known as the theological virtues. And they're, they're the virtues that the Christians talk about all the time. Now, fortunately, the Christians don't have to actually do them. They just have to talk about them. So they say, love, 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 but I hate you because you're black. I'm oh, sorry, sir. Right? That's how they, the love of, of so-called Christians talk. <coughs> but the theory of Christianity is shockingly about love and that hope and faith mixed in. Because love is not a, ver is not a, um, is not a cardinal virtue in, in the classical world. Because you didn't need to love people to have a policy. You just needed to, to get along with them. So here's my point about Nussbaum and about Buchanan and all the rest. This is a pretty good philosophical psychology. This is pretty much how humans are. As I said, there are analogies in South Asia and in China. Um, and trying to get along with a subset of them and do your political theory without all seven in action just strikes me as an unscientific mistake. You're trying to be cute if you're Hobbes, you say, oh, you don't need any, or J Jeremy Bentham, oh, you don't need any, don't need justice, love, shmove, and actually Hobbes talked this way, love, shmove, he said, to hell with love. You don't need love. Love is just self-interest. And, and uh, J Jeremy Bentham has a whole chapter where he goes through the virtues, says they're all self-interest. Mother's love is self-interest. It's completely crazy, but that's what he says. And it's trying to be clever. Adam Smith comments on this in The Theory of Morals, Morals Sentiments, which is a great book. He says, you know, philosophers love to show how clever they are by reducing everything to one thing. Because then they can, oh, look at this wonderful theorem I can prove. But I'm saying that it's all nonsense, that you can't have a society that has the virtues without starting from the virtues. As I say in the essay, if you want to pull the rabbits out of the hat, the seven, if you want to have a complete society that, that looks like a human society, not a society of wind-up toys, you've got to put the rabbits in the hat to begin with. <laughs> you can't pull them out with prudence only, or prudence plus justice, which is Rawls' idea, or prudence plus justice plus love, which is, um, which is Mar Martha Nussbaum's idea. It's not going to do it. If you want to get the others, you've got to put them in. So it's an argument, and then in the case of Buchanan, I argue, and I think this is a good point about Jim's work, he says, look, we, we can't make decisions about, about the good society or the good public policy just policy by policy. You've got to get up with a level of constitution making, right? So we make the American Constitution or the French Constitution, and it's at that level that we should be making decisions, not at the level of individual. We, in a, in, he and, um, um, he and oh, what's his name, thought about this in terms of the veil of ignorance. Get behind the veil of ignorance. What kind of constitution would you want? Well, it's got the same trouble that Martha from the left, she's a kind of a lefty, has. Jim from the right, namely.